Hello. Okay. Um, it's uh, welcome to the TCS DLS lecture today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Wayne Grover. Um, I printed out a short introductory set of notes for him, and he asked me to make it briefer. <laughs> uh, so I'll I'll try to paraphrase quickly. So. Uh, Dr. Grover Append is a Bachelor of Engineering from Carleton University, MSc from University of Essex, and PhD from the University of Alberta, all in electrical engineering. Uh, Ten years of experience as scientific staff at VNR, uh, which is now Nortel Networks, fiber optics, switching systems, digital radio, uh, joined TR Labs, founded TR Labs, and joined as uh, founding technical VP in 1986, uh, development of TR Labs research programs, and uh, saw TR Labs through the early uh, growth from a startup kind of period, and now functions as chief scientist, network systems at TR Labs, and also as professor, electrical and computer engineering at the University of Alberta. Uh, long list of honors. Uh, uh, I will uh, uh, skip this out of uh, deference to your modesty, uh, but I'll just mention he's a member of SPIE and also a fellow of the IEEE. Dr. Grover? Uh, one quick comment, uh, the, uh, as you know, uh, but in case anybody is uh, attending this for the first time, we go until 5 o'clock, and then we do have Q&A for uh, 15 minutes. Um, the telecast will continue until that time. When you ask questions, uh, please pick up a mic, ensure that it's switched on, and speak into the microphone so that the other uh, sites can get advantage of listening to your question. And also, we'll be trying to take questions from the remote site first. Uh, out of you know the usual courtesy. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. How's the sound? Is it good? Uh, hello at the other sites. Um, the first slide we have up, uh, not surprisingly, is a title slide and it's somewhat formal. But I wanted to begin by thanking you for welcoming me here today and making me feel so at home. Uh, so many friendly discussions I've had and so far already. But I wanted also to uh, share with you uh, something uh, as well to start off here. So. Just a second, and first I wanted to uh, say congratulations to the Computing Science Department here with its 40th anniversary, which I read about last year, and also to thank my organizers and hosts very much for this whole experience and event today. Um, and then to convince you I am glad to be with you today, I wanted to show you what, this is less than 24 hours ago, what I was what I actually left uh, from the house on the way to the airport. Um, and uh, the, this is at the actual airport itself. And uh, de-icing the, the wings on the plane to, to fly here. So this is what can happen uh, that far north uh, uh, in mid-April. And uh, we were starting to have spring before this one day sudden snowfall came. So it's quite a change to wake up here this morning and see all the green leaves out in the trees and no white stuff at all. So we'll be talking about optical transport network survivability and a specific emphasis in the latter half on the um, approach called P-cycles. So we could start off by just considering uh, this question, how important is, is survivability? And one, uh, one way of expressing um, the importance is in the amount of traffic that can be affected by the severing of just a a thumb-sized fiber optic cable these days. And, um, you know, often in our work we're asked to make analogies that, uh, speaking to the lay people, we can make analogies of what we're doing and so on. And in, in transport networking, it's often something to do with trucks and transportation. It is a sonnet frame like a payload truck of, a, you know, well, here's one, okay, so if a 64 kilobit highway was one lane in a highway, the fiber optic would just be a highway 60,000 miles wide with 25 million lanes. So there's something wrong with that analogy and scaling to our ordinary daily lives. But it conveys, it conveys the almost unimaginable amount of capacity that can be on a single fiber. In fact, a single wavelength on a single fiber, let alone all the wavelengths on all of the fibers in a thumb-sized cable. And I'm sure that everyone here is well aware of this, but uh, we're, we're wanting to uh, stress the amount of traffic affected by, say, a cable cut and the extensiveness of the network that we're talking about. And uh, one thing to point out is that I'm going to be talking about the survivability of what we would largely say the physical network, the actual fabric of optical fibers and wavelengths on them uh, through rights of way 
in the ground and not the connectivity that we would see between the routers, uh, actually. Um, so, so these are network maps. I always like looking at maps. I just find networks and maps fascinating. And these are a few that we've collected. Um, this is um, the uh, fiber optic root structure in, in European countries. Um, so again, these are not the uh, sort of point-to-point -point demand patterns, but these are the actual roots in the ground where we would find cables buried or trenched or ducted or overhead on poles. And this is the um, map of the corresponding physical infrastructure in British Telecom's network. Uh, this is an overlay of several carriers, physical layer uh, fiber optic infrastructure in North America. And this is an interesting network. This is Level 3's network. And uh, uh, one thing that's especially uh, fascinating about this network is, you know, uh, many of us have had long careers in telecom, and we're always used to the fact that we might study the greenfields design problem, or the problem in the case where there's nothing there already, and we solve the brand new complete problem. And we're always told, but you never get to do that in real life. Well, this network is fascinating because actually a bunch of engineers were told there's nothing on the ground. It's a clean slate. There's $8 billion in the bank to build a network. And that actually led to this design, which is highly based on uh, fiber optic ring technology, which is the technology of choice at the time, and resulted in this uh, relatively sparse physical layer uh, because of the sheer the cost, the sheer cost of of having right away on uh, those kinds of distances. So topology is a very expensive um, asset to establish. And the other thing that's interesting to share is that um, in the deregulated business environment here in the States and essentially now in Canada as well, a company like Level 3 can decide what cities they're going to serve and not serve. They're not forced to provide service to everybody. It's a profit-making um, exercise. So. In the question of which cities to serve and not serve, apparently the criteria is one that distills a great deal of other people's study and knowledge that um, level three cities are the NFL <coughs> cities. And you can see the beauty and the wisdom of, of how it condenses all these other attributes. If a city has an NFL team, it's probably got all the other attributes to be a profitable contributor to your business in, in serving fiber capacity between those centers. Um, network model from Italy and, and Belgium. Uh, this is a fairly widely used uh, European uh, inter-city regional network topology model. Um, and so I'm just giving you a flavor here. It's visually interesting to look at these networks and their attributes. And, and um, they are, of course, where the fiber lies that all of the things we know, the internet, and all of the services and everything that drives our lives today, including keeping us working no matter what time of day it is or wherever we are in the world. And everything's go, 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 always on, right? Until um, the universal cable locator. Now, have you, <laughs> are you familiar with this? Um, rather, rather raw industry inside uh, joke. Uh, this uh, device that you bring on any building site uh, we'll first off locate all the, loca the cables for you. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I couldn't believe when I started working in this survivability area and the telco people were telling me, like I was, a, they started talking about the universal fiber locator, uh, i.e. backhoe. Um, no matter what they do, they, you know, they try to bury fiber optic cables two meters down in the ground and then a meter above that you put this bright orange tape that says, if you see this tape, stop digging. Dig by hand here, fiber optic cable. You know. Everything possible that you can reasonably imagine to physically protect the cables is, is done. But the, the thing is, there's just so much of it, actually. We have some figures coming up, and it's a matter of small failure probabilities per mile being multiplied by the total distances that are there. And that's what causes so many failures. Um, now, one thing is that um, in the transport network, the uh, nodal equipments are well housed and manned and protected and fire extinguishers and redundancy all in their own design. So we don't too often see nodal failures. What really is subject to um, the awful real world out there is, and that's why they call it outside plant, 
is the actual fiber optics which are in cables and exposed to the outside world. So we could ask just how often do cables get cut? And um, one uh, set of published data says that any one mile of fiber optic cable may be cut every 228 years. So hey, we're, what am I here for? You know, <laughs> What's the issue, right? Well, uh, typical long haul network can have 100,000 kilometer root kilometers of fiber. And this is actually um, imp implying about a cut a day. Um, and this really is happening. Uh, it's because of survivability mechanisms that we don't see headlines every day. Uh, we do see headlines occasionally. But um, that's when the survivability measures are usually overwhelmed for some sort of second order reason. Um, and a typical metropolitan area may have 10,000 kilometers or miles of uh, cable infrastructure. And that's a failure of some type every three or four days or so. Um, and so I'm sure that I uh, have no real difficulty with, with yourselves convincing you that network survivability now has to be an a priori consideration in designing networks. We can't kind of just root everything and then worry later about survivability. We have to choose our architecture as one of the basic decisions in designing a fiber optic transport network. And um, some of the impacts from failures are, uh, it's an interesting thing. I, I don't get too often drawn into it, but as a group, my graduate students take a sort of perverse uh, hobby they make out of collecting reports off the internet and then news articles and that of all the various and bizarre ways that, that fiber optic cables are getting damaged. Uh, it includes the list of deep sea sharks and uh, fishing trawlers and people lighting fires under bridges. And uh, um, this is actually, um, you know, just, I didn't even have to do anything. They arranged another failure last week for me to, to include in my talk here. I got phoned by the Canadian press to be asked about this. I didn't even know about it, but apparently there was a fiber optic cut last Wednesday in Winnipeg, and uh, a whole bunch of VoIP uh, traffic across the country was out for about six hours. So I don't know, you know, normally the methods I'm going to be talking about would be employed, ring-based protection for sure, usually you'd expect. So I don't know, the story may still come out what actually happened there. Why uh, was it overwhelmed? But a great deal of traffic apparently was lost in Canada this last week from this uh, fiber damage event. Um, and it's, we, here we see the, the millions and millions of dollars of revenue loss arising from fiber optic cable cuts, uh, depending on the, uh, well, per hour of outage. Um, now another point of view is, is uh, a bit sobering, a bit thought provoking. Um, this poster, which I do not, certainly do not expect anyone to be able to read that except maybe the title. And what this is, is one of my graduate students brought this forward to me. From, it's from um, Wired News in uh, 2000 and, uh, 2006. And um, this article is saying, you know, I don't know if you recall, but 2006, there was a lot of attention given to distributed denial of service attacks, where 12 or, or so comp sci graduates with PhDs in computer science would conspire to target Google or something like that. Well, this guy's saying, guess what? You don't need a PhD to drive a backhoe. <laughs> and he's saying the ultimate denial of service attack, traditionally in this field, we we're talking about designing to protect against accidents. This is pointing out that um, with much less sophistication than would be needed for some of the level of training you folks have, PhD comp size, could arrange a distributed denial of service attack. But this guy is saying the real ultimate denial of service attack could be done with a backhoe or a couple of backhoes. Uh, so it puts a new emphasis on how do we design networks cost efficiently, but they can survive um, pretty significant damage and at least keep maybe the key uh, lifeline services um, up without interruption. So this, this slide is, is loaded with a bunch of considerations for choosing a survivability scheme. Um, we definitely want to protect against all single span failures. Um, we would like to do this with low redundancy. Okay, so I'll use the term redundancy fairly often. And I'm talking here about the ratio of spare or standby or unused resources to the working resources in the same network. So the minimum cost routing of working only as if nothing ever failed would be what we take as the working as the reference 
and then we normalize to that our investment in protection or standby or spare capacity. And that's what we mean by redundancy. So for instance, one plus one hot standby CPUs, one for one redundancy is 100% redundant. And we would like in the design of these networks to get well below 100%, but still be able to protect against any single failure or for some services protect against multiple failures in the same network. Um, the premium for getting solutions to restorability that do better than simple duplication are very large. I mean, you, 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 we've all heard bandwidth's free. Well, I had a sabbatical, a uh, few months of a sabbatical a few years ago at level three. Um, and simply the incremental capital budget for managing the growth, meeting the growth in transport equipment only, never mind the routers and that, this is just transport layer stuff, was between six and eight hundred million dollars a year. So it depends on who you talk to, whether their bandwidth is free. If I'm, the, if I'm the network operator and I have to meet this growth in bandwidth, I'm talking hundreds of millions of dollars. So if I could save 20 or 30 percent off that, um, particularly um, in how much I need to provide for survivability, these are you know, amounts that would pay back uh, my whole education and career and uh, pension and, and everyone I've ever worked with and it's just one saving of that order, you know. So, it's, so it does motivate the study of survivability with an optimization point of view to being very efficient to taking 30% off some kind of billion dollar budget. Um, so we're really, really motivated by doing better than just duplicating everything. Um, so we, we also want fast reaction speeds and one key way to get there, which will be a property of P-cycles, is that we would like survivability solutions that are pre-planned and pre-connected. So that means basically everything that's going to uh, have to be decided upon when a failure comes is pre-decided. And when a failure comes, all you have to do is make this appropriate two switching actions at the end point. So we'll talk more about how that can be achieved. Um, these days we also want for economics transparent optical networks. So these are networks that don't have to have optoelectronic conversions uh, at every switching point. Uh, the cost and power dissipation of optoelectronic switching is significant. So we'd like to have what are called transparent networks and corresponding survivability schemes that can cope with that transparency. Also networks are in flux. By that I mean that demand in the network is time varying, is time and space varying. Uh, um, behavior and also uh, we have statistical uncertainty in the future demand too. So ideally we'd like to be able to design network architectures that are robust to uncertainty and are adaptive to time and spatially varying demand patterns. Um, also this is um, a message I keep getting when I talk to telcos is uh, what we're coming to call multiple quality of protection and the idea there is that um, not every service would necessarily need the same level of survivability. Um, in fact, one of the complaints about ring-based networking, which we'll talk about, is that every signal in there gets an identical grade of single failure protection and in certain cases some double failure protection. But uh, if it's just, a, if it's just a, an SCS3 interconnecting routers at 2 a.m. for file sharing, the ISP may say, I, I could run that unprotected. I'll have other ways of slowly recovering if, it, if that was to fail. And then at the other end of the spectrum in Canada, for instance, we have the Bank of Montreal who would say, um, can you double failure protect me or even better and tell me later what it costs. You know, I mean, cost wouldn't matter to them. They just want to be able to withstand essentially anything. So the idea is how would you have an efficiently designed network where services of a designated type could, could with certainty withstand double failures and down a hierarchy to where some would not need protection at all. In fact, some may even be preempted by the others as part of the efficient design strategy of that whole network. So that's what we mean by uh, finding architectures that support multiple quality of protection. It's like a QoS concept, but pertaining to protection. Um, we, we also want to pay attention to the fundamental complexity of the design problem. Are there algorithms to design these networks well, or will we always be faced with integer linear programming uh, as the only solution method? Um, we want them adaptive. I mentioned that. Um, we want the operational complexity to be relatively low so that the technicians in the network will actually accept the scheme and be able to deal with issues such as after a failure reversion is the process of 
or even deciding whether you do put signals back to the way they were before the failure and the restoration action or just leave them the way they were. Um, and I, I talked about that last idea of it's sort of under multiple quality of protection, adaptive response for some signals to dual failures. So this is um, a, a rundown of, I would say, the main uh, survivability principles that are extant today. And uh, uh, in the research area here, though, with, I'm excluding a few, which I just don't have time to talk about. There are, believe it or not, even more known schemes than this. But um, one class of them is uh, automatic protection switching. And this is the historically longest uh, known approach. Uh, it was found even in early fiber systems uh, and radio systems, where you have one channel set aside to protect N uh, radio channels on the same shot. So if, the, if it was fading on one channel, arrangements could be made to switch to the one shared backup. Or we can have, this, this is one plus one automatic protection switching with diverse protection. So that's the idea of just taking the signal and duplicating it and sending it over two physically diverse node and span disjoint routes. Uh, so the receiver simply has to select the surviving signal. Now this will always be over 100% redundant if we're counting distance bandwidth product because the disjoint route um, will always be longer than the the shortest route, assuming that's the main working route. Um, the, this little uh, colon that's a different from different from one plus one, one four one just designates that the backup is actually not fed with the same signal all the time. It's re reserved and arranged, but it's switched over to upon failure. So there's signaling tail end, head end signaling needed. But the advantage there is anyone want to quickly tell me question to the class? What would the advantage of one four one over one plus one be? Well, I can put low priority traffic on the backup uh, until the main guy wants to claim it, uh, and that's the reason the industry has sometimes taken this this option. And one four n um, is just one standby protecting n working. Of course, if if the whole cable carrying the n is cut, then you're out of luck. That can't actually protect against an outright cable cut. But single channel failures, we can have one for end protection switching. Um, and I'm not going to say too much. Well, I really, I won't be talking about these schemes anymore than to identify them here. Uh, although one variant on uh, one for end automatic protection switching is uh, being looked at these days. It's called demand-wise shared protection. And this is um, of particular interest in Europe where you have very dense physical topologies. Physical layer topologies are actually quite rich. And you have volumes of traffic between certain city pairs that are very high. And then you can start looking at, say I had 30 uh, light waves to exchange between Berlin and, and Munich or something. And I could find three mutually disjoint routes on the graph topology. Then the idea is you would put uh, one tenth, uh, one third, sorry, ten wavelengths on each of the disjoint routes, and add uh, spare capacity spread over the three, sufficient so that if any one gets cut, you can just protection switch to the spares on the other two. That would be three-way uh, demand-wise shared protection. Um, now, self-healing rings are really in North America have come to be one of the most widely deployed technologies. Uh, we have two main types, and I have illustrations and slides on these following. So let me skip down uh, here and not use time up there. So uh, then we have the class of uh, shared mesh protection schemes. So we can have span protection or restoration, um, path restoration or path protection. And I'll talk about all of these schemes briefly, and then um, talk what I can with the time available about T-cycles, which can be themselves in span protecting uh, variant, which is probably the most classical type that most of you all may already know about, but also <coughs> node protecting, uh, node circling T-cycles, and uh, path protecting T-cycles is a more recent development as well. So um, one of the types of rings used widely in access networks is um, unidirectional path switch ring. So here we're looking on the left at um, the arrangement for a single tributary signal through a UPSR 
And the key thing is to note that when the signal comes in um, to the ring here, one copy of it goes count, uh, clockwise. The other copy, another copy is made right here and is sent counterclockwise. So the receiver in a UPSR ring always gets two, their delay differential, but that's, that's okay, receives two copies of the desired signal. And it has the simplest then independently made switching decision problem. It just says which one is surviving. Um, and of course, it's most of the time got two good ones, so it doesn't matter which it selects. Uh, and every signal in the transported in the ring is treated this way. So in fact, one way of understanding the uh, UPSR is that it's a, a collection of diverse one plus ones. It's one plus ones at the tributary signal level arranged to share the same fiber optic transmitters and receivers for basically economy of scale. So what happens when a failure occurs in a UPSR, there isn't really too much to animate. We just see the receiver alone independently making a decision to switch from the first feed, which is damaged now, over to the backup. So the UPSR has the advantages of the simplest possible switching protocol. The receiver just picks the surviving one. And every node does that independently. Um, and the whole line signal isn't being switched. The, the, um, the drawback of the UPSR is the capacity implications of this principle of dual feeding every tributary signal within it. Uh, so basically, the, the line capacity needed in the UPSR is the sum of every demand entry in the demand matrix on one side of the diagonal. Uh, because that's um, easy to appreciate just from the fact, the observation, that every demand carried by the ring between its clockwise and counterclockwise copies circumnavigates the whole ring. So if you slice the ring at any place, you will actually see one instance of the whole demand matrix there. So the line capacity of the UPSR is the, is the drawback. But again, and where economics, uh, if, I can, if I can have a very low cost uh, OC192 transmit receive circuit pack pair, and my demands are in DS1s or something, well, this, this can be uh, economically hard to beat, especially for access applications. So the bidirectional line switch ring um, routes every demand pair in its uh, bidirectional sense, the shortest or preferred way around the ring. Preferred may be related to trying to load this ring as opposed to always necessarily taking the shortest. You may find cases where you take the long route in order to maximize the utilization of bandwidth in the ring. Um, but what happens upon failure is a loopback reaction. You have uh, two fibers here, or two channel groups in general, uh, for the working mode. And then um, you have a complete set aside of the same capacity in both directions as a protection ring. The one advantage of the BLSR is I can get on and off this ring and reuse bandwidth um, because of the way that it's routing. It's not using the whole ring in both directions for every demand. So if this demand, for instance, comes in here, goes around and egresses there, then the same time slots or wavelengths are available for reassignment here. So there's an efficiency benefit to the BLSR. And here's a little animation of its switching behavior. Interestingly, actually, uh, does anyone know the, the less formal name for this diagram? I can't take credit when I was at level three giving a talk on uh, ring network planning, actually. They told me that, uh, oh, well, Wayne, that's, that's called the toilet bowl diagram. <laughs> it's so perfectly for the toilet seat diagram. Um, so, and we have a corresponding capacity principle for the BLSR ring um, that just is, um, this little expression is just taking the summation of the routing decision. So for every entry in the demand matrix, I decide to route it from its entry point to its egress point, either clockwise or counterclockwise around the ring. And then um, that's these uh, routing decisions here. And these are just uh, one zeros that encode the uh, fans found in each route around the ring from each node to each other node. 
And so this is just uh, expressing the accumulation of demands rooted over each span. And the uh, sizing principle for the BLSR ring just is that the, the ring as a whole must have enough line bandwidth that it matches or exceeds the greatest accumulation of working capacity on any span of the ring. So this actually is quite a um, better, capacity-wise, better principle than the UPSR. And this is why BLSR rings have seen pretty wide deployment in uh, more like regional networks. Uh, continental scale BLSRs are pretty relatively rare, and there's some other reasons. Uh, the capacity consumption compared to mesh is still high, and the distance becomes a factor in terms of delay. Uh, but um, so th these have been widely deployed. Um, and here we see the, uh, the switching principle is uh, completely autonomous at the time of failure. If I'm a, a, a node on a BLSR and I see my received fiber optic port go into an alarm state, I'm just pre-programmed. What I do is I take my transmit signal, I break into the protection fiber and I transmit. And I look to the received fiber and the protection ring for my replacement uh, working signal that I would be receiving. And both nodes next to the failure do that. In fact, if you have a node failure, the two adjacent nodes to the node failure just do the same thing and the result is the same as well. So you get this very autonomous, fast loopback reaction around the ring. So I can't say too much more about rings because of time, but the art of designing whole networks with multiple rings uh, has been studied a lot in the last decade. And it's been found that um, rings have this uh, sort of fundamental limitation of always occupying the space above 100% redundancy. In fact, the best solution with one ring is that you can get to 100% redundancy. The working would be full, and it's matched by an equal set aside and protection. But the problem that arises is in real networks, you're designing with interrelationships between, say, dozens or 17 or 20, kind, 20 rings. And you've got to manage the transition between rings and the bandwidth usage in each ring. And the ring networks do wind up being two to 300% redundant, as it turns out in practice. So the capacity efficiency aspect is what puts an emphasis on some other alternatives. And these are more uh, where long haul options, because here the the sheer distance kilometer related costs are, um, are worth trying to reap the savings of, of mesh-based network. Now what I'm showing here is the concept of span restoration. Um, I started clicking ahead, but the little animation is showing I may have a failure here. And what the idea in span restoration is that we would have some process that uh, assembles, and not necessarily iteratively, it may be a parallel pattern forming assembly of a set of replacement paths that is if, if, if functionally this path set would be uh, equivalent to uh, maximum flow in the available spare capacity distribution on that network or up to whatever amount of capacity was lost here. Now, I'll just show another uh, time independent or spatially non-simultaneous failure and its possible reaction under span restoration. And we see one of the key ideas of span restoration emerge. If I ask the question, so there's a different failure and a different reaction. Um, and where was spare capacity shared over the two non-simultaneous failures that were illustrated? It turns out in those two little examples, it was all of these spans. So the, the, the key thing here is that um, we have a mechanism that can place spare capacity, if we can solve the design problem, we can place spare capacity distributed on the network in a way that it's minimal in total investment, <coughs> but will permit through the sharing of that spare capacity over different non-simultaneous failures, permit the full recovery from any single failure. And these kinds of uh, networks can get into very low redundancies uh, this is some uh, design data from a family of networks where this axis, you see the average nodal degree of the network varying. So that's, you can think of the connectivity, how richly connected is the network. And here you have the capacity required and there's the three lines are, that's just total capacity. This is um, spare capacity and working capacity. So everywhere from this 
degree. Actually, it turns out in many, many cases, about 2.8, degree 2.8, is where you'll reach 100% redundancy. And from there on, as degree increases, you'll be getting lower than 100% redundancy with span restorable mesh networks. Um, and interestingly, the ratio of working to spare, I should say it the other way, the ratio of spare to working capacity in these networks is asymptotic to a measure that um, lower bound worked out long ago. I think I have a slide to show the principle of it. Um, it's 1 over d minus 1, where d is the network average nodal degree. And one of the interesting things, um, these class of networks were always asymptotic to that. This is sort of a lower bounding role. One of the things with p-cycles is we get by construction networks that are at that lower limit and not just asymptotic to it. So that's something I need to show you later. And um, just in passing, yeah, one frequent misconception I find about span restoration or span protection schemes is the assumption that all of the traffic is kept in a bundle and sent over a single reroute. But that's not the general uh, idea. The general idea would allow, for instance, a, a wavelength or a fiber to be cut, and then the whatever the constituent level traffic is being managed and switched at is the level restoration would happen at. So you could have a diverse, um, smaller granularity path set deployed in order to affect the restoration. This is key to getting that very good efficiency. This is, this is just not as capacity efficient. Um, and if we uh, want to uh, just appreciate where this lower bound of 1 over d minus 1 comes from, it turns out in span restoration that most of the time the limitation to the amount of restoration flow possible is found at one of the end nodes of the failure. The, uh, the cut of the graph in the surviving network uh, we call the incident cut. And usually the flow at one of those cuts is the limiting factor to the restoration flow. Um, and it gives rise to this end node bottleneck uh, orientation that we can go into a span restorable mesh network just look at the average end node conditions and right there alone derive this lower bound. Because if we have um, balanced capacity, it's also part of what is implied by this lower bound. We have balanced working capacity at a node, then it's a simple exercise to just realize that if I have any one failure to cope with, all I have to do is have enough spare capacity distributed on the D minus one surviving edges from the node to get the affected traffic out of the vicinity to get it away from the end node bottleneck. And that'll be the case if, if every edge has 1 over d minus 1 as its percentage of redundancy. Now a few words about path restoration and path protection. Um, so, um, path restoration switches the paradigm for recovery to the end nodes of the affected demands. Um, the failure may be local on some span, but we approach the recovery problem for path restoration with end-to-end uh, -end simultaneous recovery uh, orientation. So actually, ideally, uh, a path restoration solution is equivalent to a multi-commodity maximum flow problem where I have a number of simultaneously uh, commodities or uh, affected traffic flows between different node pairs, and I want within the resources of the surviving network to find a rerouting solution that supports all of them simultaneously. <coughs> so this is a very simple example of what the concept of path restoration would be. The failure actually, uh, first off, allows the uh, surviving parts of failed paths to be released. This is a process called stub release. And uh, AIS signal propagation can do that. So it, it, it lets the surviving parts of these paths become effectively instantaneously reverted to having a spare capacity status. And then we find a new solution, possibly reusing the stub release capacity for the affected paths. So that's a, uh, an approach that um, was studied considerably in the mid-90s, but one thing that the industry doesn't quite uh, or isn't ready or doesn't like as much is that it's a failure specific response. Um, so that where the failure happens depends, I, I react differently depending on every 
uh, location of a failure. Okay, that's in contrast to shared backup path protection, which is simpler in the sense that no matter where a path fails on its route through the network, my reaction will be always the same. I have a pre-planned end-to-end backup arrangement in what we call shared backup path protection. And so here's the a very simple example. I have a working path and a failure, and it may have had a prearranged uh, backup path. And at first, you'll be with me if you're saying, well, but isn't that just one plus one? And you know, I already talked about that. Well, in fact, so far it is. The idea in shared backup path protection is you have a, lo a set of logical one plus one arrangements made, but you take advantage of the fact that this path, for instance, and this one have no failures in common. So at least for single failure scenarios, they won't ever need a shared resource on the backup path at the same time. So this is the source of efficiency. We can have a backup path prearranged for each of these that may have some resources in common. Now, can anyone think of a, a problem with that, especially if I go back to the mention of optical, transparent optical networks? Well, what's implied here is, again, this property that I don't know until a failure happens, what backup path I actually want to assemble. So I'm assembling the backup path in real time. And this may be the assembly of transparent optical path segments, uh, which brings in all kinds of questions about link budget and impairment accumulation in the physical layer to get a 10 gig light path working um, where you've assembled five sections of it dynamically. It's uh, a little beyond. We need standards and everything and adaptive power control and so on to be sure that the on-the-fly assembly of an optical backup route would always work. Okay? So that point I make because some of the solutions later will have the property that the backup is intact before it's ever used for restoration. It never is assembled in real time. And this is just a little more general example showing you where shared backup path protection does get its efficiencies. Um, and the nature of the dynamic provisioning problem as well a little bit is shown here. That I, This is an example now of four working paths. And uh, depending on the sequence of which one came to the network first, I, I try to establish backup routes that have to be disjoint from the corresponding working route, but I try to find backups that make use of the already committed spare capacity in the network for other working paths that are fully disjoint from the current working path under consideration. So here we see a single spare channel, for instance, on this edge would get to be used three times over. Uh, and, in other words, there's only one channel there, but it plays a role in three different single failure scenarios. So that's the sharing efficiency that's good in uh, shared backup path protection. But the, uh, but the paths have to be assembled in real time. So now uh, we've got uh, less time than I would. Ideally, I'd like reserve to talk about P-cycles, but uh, yeah, we'll cover what we can. Um, so we've got this situation. Uh, um, up until P-cycles came along of rings having some very desirable properties and mesh having others. And specifically what's so desirable about rings is their speed and simplicity of reaction at failure time. Um, I commented though on their excess capacity and that still stands. Another advantage they had though, uh, still have, is that they're not based on optical cross connects, they're based on add drop multiplexers which, which are kind of a, a pay as you grow piece of equipment. You can just buy add drop multiplexers as you need, as your network grows, and they're much less expensive than the full commitment to an optical switching core and uh, cross connect to machine. So rings are fast and based on low cost nodal equipment. Now mesh on the other hand is, uh, this is argued how fast it could actually be, but um, it's suffice it to say slower because we are assembling the response at real time. Uh, even if we may have fully pre-computed what to do. But we have, on the other hand, well under 100% redundancy. Uh, although it's based on cross-connects, so there's a cost issue there. Um, and some other desirable properties, the exact solution to the planning problem, which was never reached for ring networks. Um, and working paths actually take shortest path routing in the network, not ring-constrained routing. So, um, 
this situation in um, the late 90s was kind of what made finding P cycles very interesting because if you look at these properties again, you might agree with me that if I could just pick and choose what I want, well, on the ring side of the ledger, I'll, I'll take the speed. I also would take the simplicity of the nodal equipment. Um, on the mesh side, I, I, I really would like the efficiency, please, um, and the simplicity of the planning problem and so on. So that's the kind of surprising thing. It turns out P-cycles um, give us ring speed and mesh efficiency. We actually, it is a case where we really do get both of those main desirable properties together in one scheme. Now there's one, for a few years, in fact, we wondered how can you get both things, where really are you paying the freight? And there is actually, it's a little more subtle, but in fact, I'll show you where finally we do understand where P-cycles are uh, paying some price for those two properties together. <coughs> so here's how P-cycles work. First off, in a no-failure case, this is an example of uh, the orange is, is a, is a would-be P-cycle, and this is um, a pair of paths going through the network. So one thing I want to stress is that um, some ways P-cycles are like rings, but it's easy to overlook an important difference that rings constrain the working of uh, the routing of working paths. A, a path must go through a ring in order to derive protection from the ring. In P-cycles, working paths can go shortest path over the graph or any routing principle you want, flow level, shortest paths or whatever. Um, now when a failure occurs, this is the sense in which they act like a BLSR ring. If the failure occurs on a span, then um, the cycle is used in a loopback-like manner. So this is like a unit capacity, logical, bidirectional line switch ring. Now what's different about P-cycles is that we admit the protection of straddling spans. And this is really an interesting thing because um, I still kind of break out in a cold sweat that had we had this just as a hallway conversation, one might have just dismissed. You know, Well, what if we had a ring but we added the straddling spans to what the ring could protect? Would it make much difference? Uh, probably not. And go on to the next topic. But in fact, this makes a huge difference. This is at the core of why P-cycles turn out to be as efficient as span restorable mesh, even though they're also switching with the speed and simplicity of rings. Because it's, it, it's, it's, as an engineer, it's interesting because it really is one of these cases where uh, a little technical difference has sweeping implications when uh, applied full-blown to the design of an entire network. Um, and what it is is that this uh, admission of uh, straddling spans to what the same cycle of capacity can be used to protect. So if we had a failure here, what we mean by straddling is a span that has its end nodes on the cycle, but itself isn't part of the cycle. Then when it fails, the cycle, the P-cycle is surviving, and actually it offers two protection paths per unit of its capacity to the failure span. So also, straddling spans themselves need not have any spare capacity. I could have two working channels here, no spare capacity on it itself, and the P-cycle can protect one unit of capacity, can protect that span failure for two units of working capacity. So as I've been saying, it's interesting how, you know, that's not a big technical difference. In fact, the switching at the nodes that would do this are doing exactly what a BLSR ring does. They just take the signal to and from the failed port, substitute it to and from the uh, protection fiber pair or protection transmit and receive of the P-cycle, whether it's wavelength defined or, or, uh, or channel defined. So how, how big a difference can this make? Well, this little example um, starts to give us an idea. There's, uh, this is a 13-hop P-cycle, so it itself consumes 13 channels of capacity. Um, it protects uh, 13 channels on itself with one unit of capacity. So what I mean is there's 13 instances of single loopback-like channel protection from on-cycle failures, we call them. And there's actually, turns out, uh, nine spans that straddle this and they each get uh, two channels of protection. 
And this is just a, um, this isn't cooked up one in a hundred example. This is just one we grabbed out of an actual design. Um, and uh, we can look at its individual figure of merit. Well, that implies that this protection structure has a redundancy of 42%. Does the sound get into that? A quick question um, about how unique is the choice of this cycle that you have made here? Yeah. Uh, this couldn't is, you have made just pick something else and would well, have been a better cycle? Or, or? Here in this, we're portraying just a single T cycle to, to get it to be intuitive a bit why the efficiencies can get so low. And then from here, we're going to look at how we design whole networks and which cycles do we choose exactly. Just allow me one question. Uh, why don't you root uh, to X2 branch there? Uh, why do you have to go up and down? And, uh, uh, I mean, this cycle, yeah, why does yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Why does it yeah, take well, the yeah. root it does? Yeah, is there it's, some arbitrary? Uh, it's, an, it's simply one example of cycle. Okay, yeah. okay, it's one example of a cycle. Okay, thank you. In fact, it, it, this does happen to be a Hamiltonian cycle of that graph. And there are some very significant special properties of a Hamiltonian. And, and then we were able to show, actually, uh, that this links back now to something I said about that 1 over d minus 1 asymptotic bound, which was in the literature for 10 years or so. Um, if you do the exercise with a Hamiltonian of a graph and you assume that all of the uh, potentially protected channels are populated so that every span does have two working channels present here, you'll find that a Hamiltonian directly by construction gives you 1 over d minus 1 redundancy. And in fact, there's a class of networks where we can protect an entire network with a single well-chosen Hamiltonian as a p-cycle. Now that's not always the optimal case, but it has the simplicity of a single protection structure protecting an entire fiber network. Um, more generally though, if, and uh, the way we design whole networks is uh, getting evolving uh, over the years, but uh, the basic design problem is what I'd like to try to convey here. Um, and this is how we set the problem up for integer linear program solutions so that from a research point of view at least we know when we are looking at optimal solutions and what the properties of the scheme are inherently that way instead of the really in, inadvertently the properties of our design heuristics. So we, we use integer linear program with full terminations often in the research aspect here to understand the architecture. So, so this is how we can cast the optimal design problem. We, we first uh, take a, the graph and uh, we will enumerate, and I know at a certain scale everyone will jump when I say this, we'll enumerate all cycles of the graph first. <laughs> Now, at 200 node network, that's no small problem, I agree. But uh, bear with me here. There are many cases of useful size. We can, in fact, enumerate all the cycles of the graph, and I mean the distinct simple cycles, or actually a subset of only high merit cycles that I would have to talk about a little bit later. Um, for each cycle, we ask some questions, and we just encode the parameters uh, in the ILP d definition. So first we ask, if this is cycle J, okay, so we call it a candidate cycle, we, we ask then with respect to span failure I, <coughs> how many protection relationships would that cycle provide? So for instance, this cycle turns out to be a member of, this span is a member of the cycle. So it's uh, Xij coefficient, and the problem is one. It means that if cycle, if span I fails, cycle J, if used, would provide one unit of protection for that failure. Um, so that's an X, quote, Xij equals one case. Now, uh, a different example would be to say, what happens if cycle J is used, but span I here, a different I, uh, fails, and that's straddling. So the answer would be that it can protect two units of capacity. And of course, there's a third possibility that is, for instance, a span that just um, has one, um, node on the cycle and another one unrelated at all, then xij is zero. So the first step we do is a recipe, if you like, for basic p-cycle network design is we just uh, write a script that enumerates all the cycles and finds these xij uh, answers to the questions, how much protection does cycle uh, j provide in the event of failure of span i. And then um, we can put together the integer linear program model here that will minimize the cost-weighted sum of spare capacity, subject to really two meaningful constraint systems. This first one is just saying that I must have enough spare channels on each span 
to support the <coughs> position that the decision variables about how many instances of cycle J to have imply on the network. Okay, so I'm, maybe I'm going a little the other way around. What I should do is identify my decision variables first. It's these NJ is the answer to the question for the optimal solution. How many copies of cycle J are part of the solution, part of the design? So if I know that, then this just encodes which spans cycle J lies on top of. And so that generates the spare capacity distribution of the network. And then this is my restorability constraint. It says that the uh, total number of protection relationships or the number of cycles chosen, summing over all cycles chosen in the design, must exceed the working capacity on each span failure. So this uh, short form, this is my search 100% restorability on the problem. And this generates spare capacity in order to be consistent with that being possible. And we have uh, integrality and positive integers. So uh, with that uh, ILP for the basic design problem, we can look at an actual solution and appreciate a few interesting things about it. Uh, this is the uh, demand Matri a unit demand matrix, shortest path rooted over this little test graph. And these are the resulting working channel counts to be protected. So a solution to that uh, design problem, the ILP I just talked about, actually is this set of uh, uh, five distinct P cycles, two of which have two channels and the rest are unit channel P cycles. And this um, has 50 4% redundancy and will protect against any single span failure in the resulting network. And you notice something here that's interesting. There's a span with no spare capacity on it. Now in ring-based networks, if you ever want just a quick acid test that takes 10 seconds to run, now are you looking at a P-cycle design or a ring-based or a, actually an oriented cycle cover as well? Uh, if, if you ever see a span with no spare capacity on it itself, evocative of it being a P-cycle design. Rings will always have matched working and spare on every span of a, of a network. Um, so these seven structures would entirely protect all the traffic in that network. 54% uh, redundancy. Now an interesting thing is to, uh, okay, I, I have included that. Some of these, if you notice, that's not a Hamiltonian. Uh, that's not either. Now, this is the Hamiltonian. You can see that um, the individual efficiencies of P-cycles can be very high if they are themselves are Hamiltonians on the graph and there's enough not yet protected working capacity to justify their, their choice. Um, but in some of the literature, it's been a bit getting, a, it's gotten a bit confused that people think P-cycles are only ever about using a single structure to protect the whole network and that structure being Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is just a special interesting case. In general, for optimal designs, you'll see a mixture like this one shows some Hamiltonians and other sort of more regional P cycles. Um, and that the reason just is that it's overall fitting the distribution of working capacity to be protected, which is not uniform. And um, we can think of an uh, uh, ADM-like nodal device. Of course, all the actions in a design like this could be supported by cross-connects, just generalized switching machines that can uh, define these structures and then use them for protection in the way that was shown at failure time. Cross-connects can certainly be the nodal devices that would support the existence of these seven cycles and, and use them for protection. But we can also have much, a device much more like an ad-drop multiplexer that has uh, just a fixed amount of capacity in east and west directions um, a, a working fiber and a protection fiber in each east and west. So below this, above that, that you're just looking at a ring like hydro multiplexer. But if it's a P-cycle node, we can add pairs of working port interfaces which have no protection capacity. And uh, we can, as many as there are diverse uh, disjoint straddling spans from this location, we can add pairs of working port interfaces. So this structure by itself would wind up being uh, 1 over k plus 1 
uh, redundancy where k is the number of shadowing span opportunities that are present at the site. So for just, you know, that would be a 25% redundant structure if we had three straddling spans. Um, now these findings were uh, pretty quickly corroborated by other researchers in the field, and one of those was a study by uh, Schupke and as part of his PhD in a group at University Technical University of Munich that studied this network and um, found that uh, with this included the uh, wavelength refinement issues involved too, that they uh, could confirm that they were getting like in this case, 34% redundancy if they allowed uh, suitably large cycles. So that was, um, I just share with you, I guess that that was a big step for me because we in-house had these results for a year, really, and we were going, something's wrong. How can we be completely based on cycles, but we're getting mesh efficiency? We're missing something. <laughs> and then we went to ICC 98 and published it, and nobody then said, well, what you're missing is this. So we started realizing maybe, you know, and then finally Schupke published this completely independent study and found the same thing, and so we, we were getting scientific validation uh, that what we know well now is, is really true about T-cycles. Now, I, I don't want to sound like too much of a salesman. I said you get mesh efficiency, you get ring speed, like, you know, what else would you like? There is, it took us a few years to realize this, there is somewhere where you pay for the, you pay the freight, okay? Turns out that it, is, it manifests itself in the concept of a threshold hop limit. So I'll have to speak just a bit about that first. Uh, in the study of span restorable mesh networks themselves, a fellow named Hertzberg in 94 wrote a paper that explained that um, if you were designing span restorable mesh networks and you allowed the hop length or distance length of the eligible backup uh, uh, eligible routes in the formulation of the problem. In any network, you would reach a distance allowance at which the redundancy never got better anymore. In effect, it <coughs> saturated the opportunities for non-simultaneous failure sharing of spare capacity. And this is the threshold hop limit. Okay? So we began studying where is the threshold hop limit with T cycles. And this is a sample set of results for this. This is showing the uh, total uh, spare capacity investment in the, in the design as a function of the hop limit. So here you see Hertzberg's threshold hop limit emerging. It means that in this network at eight hops, it doesn't matter if you allowed 20 hops in the restoration, you wouldn't get any better redundancy. So um, now in uh, P cycles, it's the P cycle circumference that has the corresponding notion of a circumference hop limit or threshold size limit. And that is typically two to three hops more than in span restoration. So it actually answers the question that no, we don't get everything for free. We would have to accept uh, for this network to get to the, uh, actually the threshold uh, hop, we'd be using P cycles that would have to be up to 14 hops if we want that limiting efficiency. So we do understand at least there's one way in which P-cycles don't, uh, well, we, we do pay something for those other two desirable properties we get together. Um, so this slide summarizes some of the important features of P-cycles. Uh, working paths go by the shortest routes over the graph. And this is often overlooked. Um, often papers these days in P-cycles explain the on-cycle reaction, the straddling span reaction. Um, but actually, a huge additional source of efficiency is the fact that working paths aren't ring constrained, if what we're comparing is P cycles to rings. And I have had people in industry tell me that that detail alone can be yet another kind of 30% savings in the investment in working capacity for routing shortest paths as opposed to shortest path through a set of rings. Um, and this is before you start counting redundancy for spare capacity. Um, we can build P-cycle networks based either on optical cross-connects or uh, ADM-like node devices I showed. Um, a unit capacity of P-cycle protects one uh, on-cycle channel and two straddling spans. Um, there may be up to n, n minus one on two minus n straddling span relationship on a P-cycle where n is the number of its nodes. And um, this is the source ultimately 
for why it's so efficient. We took some time to truly understand that. At first, when we got the simulation results back, we thought it was a mistake. Um, actually, with time in mind, uh, this may have to be my, my closing slide. I have now, from here, more details on the advances to paths protecting two cycles, node protecting, and, and more recent research. So let me actually choose this as my closing slide and, and just tell you a, a, a actual uh, story about peace cycles is that um, we didn't think up peace cycles. What we were doing in my lab is we were actually working on spanner strobo mesh networks at the time. Oh, I'll oh, come on or is this some recording? Four minutes will work. So we, we, ha we had colleagues we had colleagues that uh, actually lose them. We're saying that we understand and we believe actually that you can be, you can compute in a distributed way what the span restoration path set will be in well under two seconds. But the problem is we think the cross connects will be too slow to implement it in real time. So we began studying schemes for we thought initially partial pre-connection of spare channels so that we would obtain perhaps a statistical advantage. We would have a failure, we would know what path set to create, and statistically, some of the connections would already be made, so the real-time workload would be reduced. That was our thinking. We expected actually a trade-off between the percent of this readiness, pre-connected readiness, and the spare capacity penalty we would pay for this. And so we had actually a genetic algorithm running, which was allowed to use an alphabet soup of pre-connected structures. So an X would be a pre-connected structure, a linear segment, a segment with a Y off it, a tree, a cycle, everything would be eligible um, structures that it could assemble uh, a solution from. And we required of it minimum spare capacity and full restorability. And the, uh, the GA came back saying, use cycles exclusively. And now I'm going, Holy cow, I missed it for all these years. The ring based, the ring people were right. <laughs> the answer's all rings. But look at the redundancy, it's 52%. How can it be? That's mesh. Rings aren't. Finally, we, we went into the guts of the output file from CPLEX. We, we actually by then had switched it to an ILP question, not GA based question, because we got that extra purity from an optimal solution. We see it coming back. It can choose all these structures in the world, comes back saying cycles. Use all cycles. And by the way, here's the redundancy, and it's unbelievably low. And finally, we drew out of the data, in the back of an envelope, a picture, and saw the straddling spans emerge. And from there, we got it. And, but actually, it was about two weeks. I had my graduate student going back and saying, no, no. You, know, how, you cycle all cycles. But that redundancy, what's wrong in the code? What's wrong, you know? And finally, we were, all we needed to do was draw a picture on the back of the envelope, and we got it, and that was. So, so with all humility, I kind of enjoy saying that we didn't actually think up P-cycles. We was, in fact, uh, use of optimization research methods that showed us they could exist, and gave us the concept. So it's a great story for the role of OR, actually and optimization methods being used by engineers. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dr. Grover. Um, we invite questions. Uh, if there are any from the remote sites, we'll take those first. Any questions from any of the... <laughs> Um, okay, uh, maybe they'll come back. Uh, any questions from the audience here at NCSU? Yes, uh, and again, if you have any, please use the microphones in front of you or this one. I'll hand it around. Maybe I only got to talk about the part everybody knew already. <laughs> <laughs> If there, there are, uh, um, France. How long do you take to compute some of this typical problem? Or some of this typical problem? Well, um, overnight on CPLEX runs, or? CPLEX never 
ceases to amaze me, first off. It's, it's just unbelievable what we can solve. And this basic P-cycle spare capacity only placement problem is actually relatively easy. Um, 70 node problems aren't too difficult. Um, to, join, to address uh, the <laughs> which joint meaning that now I decide about the routing of working paths in conjunction with the placement of protection structures. Okay, that problem gets pretty hard and we, we can only small, solve smaller instances. But yeah, we, I mean, we, we're, um, we're users and by and large users of the tool to do the research. So we don't mind, in fact, if it takes a couple of days, we'll wait if we get. But the trouble is, of course, you never know if you've given it a problem that's gonna take the life of the universe. <laughs> you might as well just stop it and think harder about uh, some other way to approach the problem. But there is a family of uh, approaches that involve what we call uh, pre-selection of out of the huge space of candidate cycles. We have some heuristics about what are possibly elite candidates within the space of all candidate cycles. And then we try to find those by algorithmic means and then constitute a smaller ILP that is solvable. Only on, on, on only those. So we get an optimal solution of a restricted problem. Um, and we, so we don't, in some cases, know how close to the absolute optimality we are. Um, but we're currently working on, um, as, as I think I mentioned it at, at our lunch, is a combined GA ILP approach that we think can solve 200 node problems relatively, uh, relatively well, although it will still categorically at that point become a heuristic. We won't know our gap. We won't be able to say it's 10 to the minus 4 gap, you know. And then other problems can get extremely hard in the computational sense. For instance, we're working also on problems where in a transparent network, I um, constrain the use of P-cycles upon failure so that the segment of a P-cycle that is added in to replace the failure and the whole path staying optically transparent stays below a certain reach limit. That, that add, details like that add uh, quite a bit of computational complexity. But we try to study it with the perfect solutions when we can get them to understand the architecture. And, and, and if you can get access to these really actually strictly perfect solution examples, then you can get ideas for heuristics that are maybe in, um, inspired, you know, but because you see this, this, this savant, the ILP solver is like a savant, incredibly capable and it has no intelligence really. And yet it, if it gives you solutions, you can sometimes say, oh, that's what it's doing. What it's doing is this. And then we give, a st you know, if you can say that in English, what it's doing is it's associating large cycles with small paths and vice versa. And then you've got a foothold on a heuristic that could be good for that problem. So I'll take that as an endorsement that if you don't do the CPLEX homework, you're going to fail um, uh, just for students okay. in my course. Um, if there are no more questions, please join me in thanking the speaker again. And, uh, Thank you very much. <laughs>